Oh, it says the host has disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, it now thinks I'm a, a participant, Martha. So I think because I made you the host. There we go. So uh, I'm grading. Um, this, this, I've used several for presentations I've given about ungrading. I've used this picture of a, of a baby cow, and I've used some pictures of a, of a larger cow uh, staring, staring us down. And it isn't necessarily the idea of cows being um, meat and that, you know, there's, a, there's often a connection made between the history of grading and the history of grading meat, the history of grading students. Um, uh, but more because of the way that these pictures are about tagging, tagging things in our world that, that uh, in giving them a crude number, the, the, the cow kind of demands that I, sort of looking at me out of the corner of its eye, demanding that I do right by it. So ungrading means raising an eyebrow at grades as a systemic practice, distinct from simply not grading. The word is a present participle, an ongoing process, not a static set of practices. This is one of the reasons why I've been somewhat disturbed by seeing ungrading become a bit of a zeitgeist over the last several years. Uh, oftentimes when I see ungrading referred to or written about in the press, there's almost an ungrading TM, little TM after the word ungrading. And I really wanna push back on that idea. Grading is not a static set of practices. There isn't a secret way of doing ungrading. There isn't five best practices that, that I can share. There is no expert in ungrading. Ungrading is a critical, it's critical work. It's raising our eyebrows at the structures that make grades go. I also don't believe for as much as I attempt to practice ungrading and talk about ungrading, I don't believe it's possible to snap our fingers and have grades go away. Even if we agreed to have grades go away at our institutions, if we get an entire institution to agree to not have grades, the students coming to that institution would have likely still been encultured into a system of grades. We as teachers, most of us have been encultured into a system of grades. So grades are with us no matter what. And I think that the important work as this points out, is to raise our eyebrows at them and think about the ways that they structure so much of our experience in education. Assessment tends so much to drive and control teaching. Much of what we do in the classroom is determined by the assessment structures we work under. Ranking, metrics, norming, objectivity, uniformity, accreditation, measurement, rubrics, outcomes, quality, data, performance, Averages, excellence, curves, inflation, mastery, standardization, rigor. I force myself with this slide to read each of these things aloud every time I put this slide up in part because two things. One, it feels overwhelming. And the other is it feels exhausting to the point of almost feeling like you want to give up by the end. And so many of us and so much of our, pra our practice is weighed down by these institutional, these things within our institutions, these buzzwords. Conventional grading is often at odds with our institutional missions. So far, I haven't seen a school mission statement with any of these. We pit students and teachers against one another. We rank students in competitive ways. We measure output with little concern for the learning process. We value extrinsic over intrinsic motivation. We start from a place of deep suspicion of students. We assess in ways that reinforce bias against marginalized students. And it's a practice that I've taken, uh, taken to doing relatively frequently at the institutions where I've worked, which is pointing to the institutional mission. Because often, while not all institutional missions are perfect, often institutional missions are directly at odds with the practices that we're raising our eyebrows at or critiquing. The institutional mission describes the reason and why the work we're doing here this week is necessary, or most of our institutional missions do. Bias in education. Black girls are 12 times more likely than their white counterparts to be suspended. While Black children make up less than 20% of preschoolers, they make up more than half of out-of-school suspensions. 
Teachers spend up to two thirds of their time talking to male students. They also are more likely to interrupt girls. When teachers ask questions, they direct their gaze towards boys more often, especially when questions are open-ended. This is from a piece by Soraya Shimali called All Teachers Should Be Trained to Overcome Their Hidden Biases. It's in Time Magazine and you can actually go to the piece and click on each of these, uh, each bit of data shared in the piece, allow links to the full study. And there's some, there's some relatively disturbing studies there, um, things that I even have trouble grappling with. Uh, honestly, when I read the middle bit here, while black children make up less than 20% of preschoolers, they make up more than half of out of school suspensions. I can't help but be befuddled by the notion that preschoolers are getting suspended at all. Um, I have a black daughter with two gay dads who was adopted and the notion that she would be suspended from preschool is shocking to me. Uh, I, when I talk about this, I frequently though then point out, which as I'm going to now, that that shock is a point of privilege. The reason that I'm shocked is because the notion when I was in preschool of me being suspended preschool was unfathomable. This is so outside of my educational experience but it's not outside of the educational experiences of all the students that we work with. So it's important to not only think about when we're grading students, it's important for us not only to be thinking about the material circumstances of those students, but also their educational histories and how those educational histories affect the work that they do with us. This is a meta-analysis about bias and grading. It includes, um, it includes 23 analyses, 20 studies, a total of 1,935 graders. The results suggest that bias can occur in subjective grading when graders are aware of irrelevant information about students. So ultimately, this study uh, or meta-analysis of many studies found that there was a great deal of bias in grading. Specifically, the focus of bias for this meta-analysis could have been prior experience with a student, some physical characteristics such as sex, race, or physical attractiveness, or some assigned status such as being classified as gifted or learning disabled. Ultimately, the authors argue for blind grading. And uh, I find that problematic. Uh, I'd argue race, gender, and ability do not constitute irrelevant information. We can't counter bias by ignoring it. Who our students are is exactly relevant and their specific challenges need to be accounted for in our approach to assessment. This piece imagines that there is an objective way to do the work of grading. And ultimately I would argue that grading is by nature deeply subjective. Food insecurity is a significant factor in determining the average math SAT score. An increase in food insecurity lowers the student's math SAT score. So when we're assessing students, what is it are we assessing? Are we assessing their aptitude? Are we assessing their progress in math? Are we assessing, assessing their success in their studies of math? Or are we assessing another variable, like the likelihood that that student might be food insecure? Osterk et al. found that students perform more poorly on exams when they are several weeks removed from receiving food stamp benefits. So their performance is not only their performance aptitude success is not only affected by whether or not they're food insecure, but how recent whether they've received support and how recently they received that support. Children displayed a statistically significant increase in cortisol level in anticipation of high stakes testing. Large decreases and large increases in cortisol were associated with underperformance on the high stakes test. So two things here, um, students perform on standardized assessments uh, less well when they're experiencing, when they have high cortisol levels, which would be associated with anxiety. So high anxiety decreases performance. It also points out here that low cortisol levels is also associated with underperformance on standardized exams. Uh, low cortisol levels would be associated with trauma and specifically dissociation. So if we think about the students that we're working with right now, we are working with a lot of students experiencing already high cortisol levels and low cortisol levels because of anxiety and trauma. And our, the, uh, ultimately the higher stakes the exam, the more likely it is to cause stress whether the exam is remote proctored increases the stress 
Interestingly, high stress also leads to increases in cheating, and cheating also increases stress. So there's a giant storm here of stress, anxiety, and trauma that are impacting our students' performance on standardized assessments. So some alternative forms of assessment. Minimal grading, using scales with fewer gradations to make grading simpler, fairer, clearer. How can we reimagine the structures that we already have so that, as Elbow argues, we're not using 1,000 point scales, we're not using 100 point scales, but maybe we're thinking about using 10 point scales or three point scales like check, check plus, check minus, scales that communicate clearly to students and aren't arbitrary. Ultimately, the only thing you know about a student who got a 93.5 versus a student who got a 92.1 is that the student who got the 93.5 did better than the student who get, did, got the 92.1. And interestingly, there's quite a bit of data out there that shows that when students are graded, they um, the grade they don't associate the grade that they receive with their work they associate the grade that they receive with themselves so great when they're graded it isn't their work being graded it's actually their self that is being graded contract grading grading contracts convey expectations about what is required for each potential grade students work toward the grade they want to achieve and goalposts don't unexpectedly shift and i specifically want to point you to a book by a sao b inui called anti-racist assessment ecologies where uh, and i believe did we we included a little excerpt from that i thought in our reading for today martha um, where he talks about what he calls labor-based contract grading which means associating the performance in a course or success in a course with the work that students do and not necessarily the, an assessment of the quality of that work. So a focus on process, not product. Authentic assessment, having students write for real world audiences, focusing on intrinsic motivations and drawing students into the design of assignments and assessments. There is actually productive pushback on the notion of authentic assessment. I do, I do like authentic assessment and have used it in my own courses. For example, having students put on a film festival and having real world audiences for their work or an example like having students in um, uh, digital in a digital storytelling class sharing their work with a broader audience beyond just the students in the course beyond the students at the institution uh, beyond even their own uh, their own country. Um, there is productive pushback on the notion of authentic assessment because the experience that the student has might be authentic, but what kind of experience are we creating for the students at our institutions? Are, inst are our institutions by their nature inauthentic in some way? And does that then affect the work that students do? And this last one is what I have spent most of my career doing, 21 years that I have been pushing back on traditional uh, approaches to assessment. And that's process letters, asking students to reflect on their work and offer feedback on those reflections. Students help guide the grading of their own work. And Martha has also talked about this a little bit this week. But essentially, my goal in ungrading or my goal in pushing back on traditional assessment is to draw students into um, the work of assessment, to draw students in the into the pedagogical approach of the courses that I teach. So some questions that I often get asked when I present about ungrading. Would you describe ungrading as a decolonizing, radical, progressive, feminist, critical, pedagogical practice? Grades reinforce teacher-student hierarchies and institution-teacher hierarchies while exacerbating other problematic power relationships. Women, people of color, disabled people, neurodiverse people, indigenous people are all ill-served by a destructive culture of grading and assessment. Ultimately, what I would say in answer to this question is that no, ungrading is not by itself a decolonizing, radical, progressive, feminist, critical, pedagogical practice. For example, if we have an anti-racist approach to grades, 
but the curriculum or content of our course is not equally anti-racist, then we're not effectively doing anti-racist work. So these things have to be paired. It has to be a conversation that moves beyond grades. One of the reasons so much of my research and focus has been on grades is in part because grades become a bit of an everything but the kitchen sink of education. So many of the conversations that we have in education at grades are the elephant in the room of those conversations. And so ultimately researching and talking about grades, I end up talking about just about every facet of education because it feels like grades have their tendrils in just about everything. It's the reason I can't stand learning management systems. As I've said elsewhere, in a learning management system, all roads lead back to the grade book. And that is why I feel like those tools are broken at their core, among, among other things. In removing grades, we have to be sure we aren't just shifting the goalposts for students, replacing clear policies with hidden curriculum. Ungrading can unsettle power dynamics in productive ways, but it can also reinforce structural biases if those biases aren't explicitly acknowledged and accounted for. I think this is why I push back on the notion of blind grading, because I think it just tries to sideline the conversation, the really important conversation that we need to be having about race gender, ability, neurodiversity, et cetera, in, in our courses and with our students. What if I'm contingent, precarious, sessional adjunct? Well, interestingly, I was a road warrior adjunct, uh, as people have heard me say, for, uh, for many years of my career, I was an, an adjunct for, I believe, 11 years um, of the 21 years that I was teaching. And at one point I taught nine courses at four different institutions and I was subjected to the very specific, sometimes draconian rules of those institutions. Navigating those hurdles and in institutional cultures has been a challenge, some strategies that work for me. I make sure my pedagogy is well-researched. I bring students into the conversation about my approach. I figure out what the firm rules are and follow them. We usually internalize way more restri restrictions than there actually are. I think that this one is really key. When we feel like we can't do something because there is a rule at our institution that says such and such, I think that the most important thing that we can do to start that conversation is put the rule in front of us and have a conversation about what the actual policy barriers are. Even if that ultimately then results of figuring out what, what, how we push back on those policies. I'm going to skip that slide. Can you share specific examples of the kinds of prompts you use for the self reflections you have students do? So this is from a course that I was teaching. I believe this was the course that I was teaching in spring of last year. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. So uh, ultimately, what I do when I introduce um, self-reflection and self-evaluation to students is I spend an entire week of the course on metacognition. And some folks often say to me, well, wait, I can't spend a whole week on metacognition. There's already so much that we're loaded down with in my course. I think this gets back to the point that Martha was making yesterday about how much content is really necessary. If we strip some of that away, what does it make space for? What does it leave room for? So I have them read several readings a piece directly about metacognition. The next piece, the web we need to give students, this is a digital studies course. So I teach something within the discipline that connects the field that they're working in to the larger point about metacognition. And then they, they read the case against grades, um, which is a great one for starting conversations with students. And then I ask them to submit their self-reflection. And I'm gonna show you some examples of what that looks like. Uh, as you're working on this self-reflection, consider the statement on grading and assessment from our course syllabus. While you will get a final grade at the end of the term, I will not be grading individual assignments. You will be reflecting on your own work and the work of your peers. My goal here is to remind them of what the pedagogical approach is that undergirds this self-reflection and give them the moment to sort of pause before they begin that work. I also link right to the case against grades. So they kind of understand what my motivation is and so that this itself doesn't end up feeling like a form of busy work. So then I have a series of questions. Usually one of them is a prompt like this one. Write me a short letter that reflects on your work in this class. Consider the work you did on the final project, your work earlier in the term, the feedback you offered your peers, and how you met your own goals. Feel free to include more links to examples of your work. Tell me what you are particularly proud of. This is a place to be as honest as possible about your work, both reflecting critically and talking about what you proved capable of in what continues to be an incredibly challenging time. 
And then they, they answer that question. And then the final is, bit is for them to give themselves a grade. What final grade would you give for this course and why? And this is what I added during the pandemic. At this point, let's not quibble the details between grades. If you're on the fence, round up. Self-evaluation can be hard, but don't feel a need to be modest. Your work has value, every bit of it. And each of us will have engaged in the course in different ways and at different times. Grade what you did, not what you didn't do. And then they get to choose. And one of the things I've moved towards is this approach where they can give themselves an A, they can give themselves a B, and then it says something lower. If you choose this option, send me a message on Slack so we can check in. Um, I have, I, before the pandemic, I had tried A, B, C, something lower, send me a message. During the pandemic, it felt important to sort of acknowledge that students were going to do well and that this was going, that, that they, were gonna, they were gonna be successful in the class and that's what I was gonna work towards achieving. Um, I have them do this multiple times throughout the term so that they don't just hit this at the end um, inexplicably. So I'm just gonna end with this quote from Sean Michael Morris. He says, Deciding to ungrade has to come from somewhere, has to do more than ring a bell. It has to have a pedagogical purpose and to be part of a larger picture of how and why we teach. So I'm going to stop the share and stop the recording and then just open up a conversation about anything that I've that I put so far about that provocation, the idea of where do we draw the line, if grades do do harm, at what point are they doing too much harm? <clears throat> and uh, if folks have additional questions for me or just other points of conversation, feel free to jump in. Um, Jesse, can you stop the recording? Because when I made you host, I lost the ability.